So today I want to talk about Azure Cosmos DB. Uh, I just want to get kind of a show of hands. Uh, how many here have uh, either done some dev or testing uh, in Cosmos DB? All right, just a few. Anybody running it in production? One guy running in production? Awesome. Okay, good. So for most of you, this is all new. Other than just the slide you saw like two minutes ago about Cosmos DB, was it being new for you? Okay. <laughs> all right. So. Here we'll go over uh, in today's session. I want to give you kind of a high-level overview uh, of Cosmos and DB, uh, kind of what it is, how you'd use it, uh, the scenarios for it. Um, I want to dive into the resource model uh, for Cosmos DB and just talk about the various top-level objects uh, within Cosmos itself. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about partitioning uh, in Cosmos DB. This is uh, an important concept to understand uh, when developing and building. Uh, and running applications uh, using Cosmos. Uh, I'm going to talk about a concept we have called request units uh, that's uh, specifically around throughput. Uh, and you need to understand request units and how they work and why we use them. Uh, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about indexing. Uh, and then I want to focus uh, more time around replication. Uh, and I'll talk about a new feature uh, that was just discussed called Multimaster. Uh, I'll then dive into some new stuff uh, that we've just announced recently at the Ignite conference uh, just last month. Uh, and then I want to help you get started, so I'll spend some time going over some resources uh, that we have just to help you uh, learn the product, understand where to go, uh, learn more, and then uh, we can do some QA after that. And that should hopefully wrap it up for, what am I at, 75? 70 minutes, okay. <laughs> If that gets any shorter, let me know. So, uh, so what is Cosmos DB? So, Cosmos DB is Microsoft's globally distributed, uh, massively scalable, scalable uh, multi-model database. Uh, this is really the service that if you're going to build a planet-scale application in the cloud, this is the database uh, you'd want to use. Uh, we support multiple models or formats. So, we have native support for key value, uh, column family like Cassandra, uh, document databases like MongoDB and our own native document format, uh, as well as support for graph. Uh, and we, pri we provide wire protocol support as well uh, for those for MongoDB, uh, Gremlin uh, for graph, and then Cassandra. Uh, one of the nice things about Cosmos DB, or what makes it what it is, is just basically the replication. So uh, we have built-in turnkey global distribution for all of your data within Cosmos DB. Uh, we also are really built around resource governance. So one of the things about Cosmos DB is you can get elastic scale out of both your storage within Cosmos DB as well as the throughput within there. And I'll talk about that a little bit more a little later. Uh, we have well-defined consistency models. So most databases you have like a strong or an eventual. We provide five levels of consistency uh, within your databases that you can choose from. Uh, we do all of this with low latency, so guaranteed single-digit latency at the 99th percentile and even less at the 50th percentile. Uh, high availability, so uh, we're among the, one of the only services in Azure that provides five nines uh, availability uh, for your applications. And of course, all of this is backed up by comprehensive SLAs uh, within Azure. So Cosmos was really built to support kind of the next generation of cloud applications. Uh, and there's some really key features that really make this possible, certainly with being able to distribute your data globally. Uh, this helps put the data where your users are. Um, some scenarios around this would include, say, e-commerce. Uh, if uh, you know, users that want to buy stuff out of your application want to do so very quickly, getting that data as close to them as possible uh, is super important. Uh, other applications like IoT uh, or gaming uh, or even fraud detection, uh, say you're an Experian or a financial services company, you need to be able to see transactions and activity happening around the world. Being able to replicate that data globally in milliseconds uh, is going to be key to understanding what's going on with your customers. Um, another feature uh, or capability with Cosmos DB or another use case uh, is being able to do analytics over operational data. Uh, Cosmos DB has uh, support for Spark uh, in, in our Spark connector, uh, so you can use that and then light that up to do um, insights and get insights into your data uh, using Cosmos DB. 
uh, as well. Uh, and then finally, if you're already running uh, a MongoDB or Cassandra workload, either on-prem or in VMs, uh, you know, we provide kind of that lift and shift as well, where you can migrate your data into Cosmos DB, uh, and then using the MongoDB or Cassandra APIs, uh, continue to work uh, with your applications uh, as they were built. So let me dive into kind of the resource model. So this is a bit of a 101 Azure. So at the highest level, you're going to have an account. Uh, and here you would provision a new account within Azure either using the portal. We also support PowerShell or CLI to provision new accounts. Uh, when you provision the account, you're going to create a new name for it. And this name uh, is going to become a unique global URI uh, for your access to Cosmos DB. Uh, and then, of course, similar to kind of how Azure Storage works, uh, at the account level is also where you get your keys. So we support uh, read-write keys and read-only keys uh, so you can help uh, kind of maintain the different levels of access for your data uh, within Cosmos DB. Uh, within the portal here, you can kind of see here's the kind of information you would have to create or enter uh, to create your new account. So at the top here, you're going to enter in an ID, uh, and that needs to be globally unique across all of Azure. Uh, and then you choose an API, so you could choose SQL or Mongo or Cassandra or Table um, or Graph within there. Uh, select your subscription that you want to run it from. You can create a new resource group or use an existing, uh, and then you can select a location or a region for it to run in. So the next layer down from there is the database, and essentially uh, this is just kind of a logical, if you will, abstraction uh, for containers itself. So Databases can have one or more containers. And then within the containers, these are essentially buckets where you put your data. And depending on the model you use, this is either going to be a collection uh, or a graph uh, or a table uh, within Cosmos DB. So here I want to show you kind of the blade where you would create a new container. So here you're going to enter a collection ID or a name of the collection. Uh, and then what you need to do is specify the capacity for it or the storage capacity. So here, I want to point out something. So we do a lot of work to help abstract away the physical layers for these things within Cosmos DB. If you're going to build a, a really massive scale global database like this, uh, and you're going to have terabytes or petabytes of data, you're going to have to deal with things like storage and that. Uh, within Cosmos DB, uh, we really provide that kind of abstraction away from that sort of thing. And the way where it kind of surfaces here it is within the storage capacity. Uh, so the max size for the SSD disk uh, within Cosmos DB is going to be set at 10 gigabytes. So if your data grows beyond that, then if, you are, if your data doesn't grow beyond that, you can just create a single fixed size uh, uh, storage uh, capacity within there. And then you don't need to specify a partition key. But if you grow beyond that, we're now going to have to provision multiple disks and multiple physical partitions to store that data. So you then need to specify a, par a partition key uh, to help us find where your data is going to be. Uh, the next thing you need to know is in here you're going to specify uh, throughput capacity. So these are going to be resource units within here. Now I want to talk, I'll talk a little bit more about resource units uh, a little bit later, but I just want to point that out that here is where you're going to see some of the logical and the physical kind of surface through. Uh, when you're creating a new account. The next layer in here is the, excuse me, the items. And this is essentially where your data gets stored. So all the records, all the documents that you put in there. There's also some other objects that are at the container level uh, that you would define or associate with a container. And that includes things like stored procedures, uh, triggers, or user-defined functions. Uh, and then there's a new object called conflicts, uh, and I'll talk about conflicts a little bit later in the talk. So let's go a little into partitioning. So when you're building really large databases, you typically would have to span multiple clusters of machines uh, to be able to store all that data. Uh, and this is the model we use. It's a scale out for that. And in Cosmos DB, we manage all of this for you. So let me walk through an example here. So Excuse me. Here I have a Cosmos DB container uh, full of users. And this data is going to be well over 10 gigabytes, so I need to define a partition key. In this case, I'm going to use user ID as the partition key for the data. And what this does is it represents a logical abstraction 
for the partition of data that you're going to store within there. So behind the scenes, what we do is we create a hash of the user ID and then distribute that data over the hash values to a set of physical partitions where we're actually going to store the data. So when you look at this in practice, here's my contacts database, and I'm using my hash ID. So within here, I've got different users, different user IDs. So I've got an Andrew and a Mike, and then a Bob, and then a bunch of people over here on the, on the right. So within here, you can kind of see here's the amount of physical storage being used by each of, uh, each of the records using these partition keys. And here you can see Andrew and Mike are sharing a single physical partition here over the left. We've got Bob with a lot more data. He's basically taking up all of partition two. And then I've got these other users on the right. There's not much data for them. So we basically collapsed them down onto a single partition here uh, on the right. So what happens then if one of these grows larger? So if I've got, say, Dharma here and Sharish, uh, they're growing too large to sit on that single partition there. So what we do behind the scenes is we will actually move them from one partition into another partition and do this seamlessly. So you'll never see this ever happen. We actually will manage all the physical storage for all of your data within the partitions without you having to do anything. The only thing you have to do is just to find the partition key that you want to store the data on. So one of the questions we obviously get then is, well, what's a good partition key for my data? And the answer is, uh, it depends. Um, one of the things you need to keep in mind when you're designing a, a good partition key is you want to make sure that you're distributing the request uh, across as many partitions as possible. You want to avoid what we call a hot partition. Now the idea for a hot partition, let me give you an example. So let's just say I've got an IoT application. It's a fleet management uh, application. And each of those, I'm tracking the, the telemetry from each of the vehicles that's driving around every day. And maybe they're delivering, I don't know, goods or something like that, or they could be doing anything. And the ID that I select for the partition key is date. So what do you think is going to happen when the telemetry from all those vehicles starts to write to Cosmos DB? They're going to use the date for the partition key. So now that partition for that date is going to be super hot because everybody's writing to that same partition every day. Right? So every day, the next day, that partition is going to be the hot one. Likely, too, if you're running analytics over that data, the reads are going to come out of that same partition. So it's going to be doubly hot because you've got lots of writes going into the same partition. And then the reads are all coming out of the same one. So what's the takeaway? Date's generally a bad idea for a partition key, or at least in this instance it is. Uh, probably a better partition key would be maybe using the vehicle ID. Uh, that way, each vehicle writes to its own partition. That data grows at a set rate over time. You've got reads and writes generally going off uh, those partitions in a well-distributed way. You can even do something else, like you could create, say, a composite key. So I want to compose a vehicle ID and the date. So you could also do something like that. So the idea here is distribute the writes, distribute the reads, uh, and then just try to avoid these hot partitions uh, within there. Um, just some of the things that we kind of suggest customers to do. There's really no silver bullet for designing the right partition key for your data. Really, the, the only and the best way of doing this is, is just building like a proof of concept application uh, and then test it, right? It's really helpful to understand kind of what are the queries that I'm going to be running uh, here in my data, right? What do the writes look like? What do the reads look like? And you don't need to be perfect. Like, you can get into some analysis paralysis on this and making sure that I'm accounting for every single query that's running against my database. Generally speaking, if you apply a bit of an 80-20 rule, uh, you should be in really good shape for this. Uh, the other thing I want to point out, too, is our SDKs will actually help you with this. There's actually uh, metrics you can get out of our SDKs to kind of get the cost of what it's doing for our use uh, within there, which is the thing you really want to measure is the resource usage, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Uh, you can also look at Azure Monitor. So we're fully instrumented through Azure Monitor. You can get data through there as well. Uh, we also have uh, some sample apps out on GitHub, and I'll, I'll kind of walk you to where those things are. But we have some test harnesses that you can use, and just apply the patterns within there, and then run your test through those, and you can get our use as well as the latency uh, on your applications within there. So let's talk about request units. 
So what is a request unit? It's basically a way to represent provision resources uh, for your database. And it wraps up physical concepts such as memory, CPU, uh, and IOPS. In the physical world, when you were, if you were going to design a distributed application like this, these are things that you would have to account for, right? This is would be part of the, the capacity planning, right? How much data am I going to store? How fast is it going to grow over time? What is my usage going to look like? How many requests am I going to have to satisfy? How fast do those need to go? What we really try to do here is to abstract all of that complexity away from you. I mean, the nice thing about Cosmos DB is that it's completely managed, right? So the only thing you need to figure out is what does my throughput need to be? And then, of course, also how much storage am I going to need? But even in that case, if you select unlimited and use a partition key, we're handling that for you as well. So really, for us, our use kind of provide that metric for how we manage resources uh, behind the scenes, and it's also key for the SLAs that we provide for the service. So something to keep in mind is not all our, not all our use or not all requests are, are the same. So a read is going to be less expensive than a write. Uh, a read is just simply going to go to the replica and then pull the data back. But if you're doing a write, that write needs to then be sent on to other replicas, and that's going to cost more in terms of RUs within there. So queries themselves uh, will consume different RUs depending on how the query is written uh, and whether that query can be uh, resolved from a single partition uh, or whether it needs to scan partitions to go get all the data. So this is another reason why testing uh, on your applications is super important because you want to make sure that your queries are operating as efficiently as possible and not having to scan uh, multiple partitions. So everything that you do in your database is going to consume uh, RUs in there. And when requests go over the amount of provision RUs, uh, you're going to end up getting rate limited. Now, the, this results when you're calling the database in a 429 getting returned uh, back by the service. Now, if you're using one of our SDKs, like our Java or our .NET SDK or our JavaScript SDK or our Python SDK, uh, we'll actually handle uh, this response for you and then do an automatic retry on that. And in fact, you can configure the number of retries uh, that you want our SDK to do that. Uh, if you're using our low-level REST API, then you would have to trap that 429 response that's coming back and then implement your own uh, retry logic, and you can put a back off in there uh, as well. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that our users spread across partitions. So you can get a hot partition uh, and still end up, and end up getting rate limited while you have other partitions that are sitting there uh, completely idle. So this is another thing to keep in mind when you're designing and modeling your data and designing and, and testing it uh, is that you are distributing that load as equally as possible uh, within there. So let me talk a little about indexing. So by default, Cosmos DB will index all the data within your collections. Uh, you don't need any schemas or secondary indexes within there. Uh, if you add new data, uh, within your records, we'll automatically index that as well. You don't need to make any changes or do anything. And this works for every model we support in Cosmos DB. So with Mongo, with Cassandra, with Graph, with our own native format, everything is indexed all the time. However, you can customize that. So we support custom index policies. And if you want, you can specify the shape of your index while maintaining that same flexibility uh, within your data model. So what you can do is just specify the type of index you want, and you can see in here we've got a hash, a number, or even a spatial within there, uh, and then include, and then write the paths that you want indexed, uh, and then you can also exclude paths within there. So in some cases you may have data that makes no sense to index, maybe it's just a wide chunk of data or whatever like that, and you're never going to write any queries over it. Uh, here you can specify custom index policies, exclude certain paths from being indexed, this will help improve the performance of your application. So now, let's talk about replication. So if you're going to build a global scale application, uh, you really need your data to be uh, as close as it can be uh, to your users. You know, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So even if your application is deployed everywhere around the globe, uh, your data still needs to travel across our backbone. So let's just say you have an application, and I've got a web 
uh, web endpoint in Singapore, and West US, and East US, and Northern Europe. So in terms of the response rate from customers located in those regions of the application, it's going to be really fast. But if I'm doing anything on the data end of things, it's still going to be really slow. Uh, so the idea here, and the best thing, one of the best things about Cosmos DB is our ability to be able to replicate that data globally uh, around the world. And replicating data within Cosmos DB is really simple. All you need to do is just add a new region within the portal, and then we'll replicate all of that data for you, and then make it available. So essentially, every action on that data from that point on will happen there locally. So just to kind of illustrate kind of the latencies we're talking about here, here I've got an application uh, or a VM that's sitting in West US, uh, and then I've got a Cosmos DB instance sitting in Southeast Asia. So this is sitting in Singapore. And here you can kind of get an idea of just what kind of latency you're talking about. So I'm going to hit the application in West US. That's going to be really fast. But the application itself needs to travel all the way to Singapore to go get the data. And you can see uh, there's quite a bit of latency here involved, generally about 200 milliseconds, just under the best conditions. But it can be even further, uh, way more, uh, depending. Versus this, where I've got an application uh, in Cosmos DB in the same region, so now you're seeing the kind of uh, latency that you would expect, and in fact what our SLAs provide, which is going to be single digit latency. Uh, so generally less than 10 milliseconds at the 99th percentile. So as I mentioned, Cosmos DB automatically replicates all of your data globally. Uh, and all these regions are hid behind a single global URI that you use in your applications. This was the account ID that I talked about earlier when you create your Cosmos DB account. Now, when you deploy your applications, you just simply tell the client which region it's going to run in, and then Cosmos DB will automatically use that region to talk to the database. And then if that region becomes unavailable, uh, what we'll automatically do is we'll retry that request on the next closest region. So let's talk a little about consistency models. So as I mentioned before, a lot of databases out there in the market today just provide strong and eventual. Cosmos DB provides five consistency models you can choose from, from strong all the way to eventual. Now there's some serious trade-offs between these and it's important to understand the difference because all of them have an impact on availability, latency, and throughput. Now obviously on one end of the spectrum you have strong. So in this scenario, all reads are guaranteed to be the latest records. The trade-off, of course, is the higher latency and the lower throughput you're going to get by using a strong consistency model. And then on the other end of the world, you've got eventual. So in that model, there's really no guarantee that you're going to get the latest record, but you do get the lowest latency and the highest throughput. Now you might think, why would I ever want to use eventual for a consistency model? But there's actually scenarios where this is actually okay or it's fine. Uh, let's say you're using or building a social media application where you don't mind when kind of updates kind of come in, it's okay, or say a leaderboard. Uh, an example of this would be like a golf leaderboard, right? So, you know, you've got the guy up there and he's got the little things and he's poking them up there and, the, you know, Tiger Woods just made a birdie on the 18th hole, but you don't see that for a few minutes, but eventually you see the score up there. That's kind of an idea of where eventual is fine uh, as for a consistency model uh, versus, say, strong. Um, what I would say around the consistency models is uh, most customers will test uh, consistency models for their application and dial it into the one they think is right. Generally, I think about 70% of all of our customers end up using session consistency. And here what that really means is you can read all of your own writes. And basically what that is, is that's tied to the connection uh, from your application to Cosmos DB. Uh, a lot of other customers, or a few more customers, a, a lesser amount, we use the bounded stateless uh, in there. But I think what's important is that you test these and see the impact uh, on the application. And depending on the scenarios, uh, pick the one that makes sense for you. Uh, the other thing I'll point out, too, is uh, you can also change this and relax it. Uh, and you can do this on a per request basis as well. So there may be scenarios where you need to dump a bunch of data and you kind of don't care when it gets in. Uh, you just need the throughput or, the, or the, the low latency for that. So you could drop it all the way to eventual if you're at like a session or a bounded staleness uh, and do that on a per request basis within there as well. Okay, 
let's talk about the thing I am so excited about. So this was my feature, Multimaster. Has anybody, not, who's not heard about Multimaster? No, everybody's heard about it because they just talked about it before I got on stage. So, anyway, Cosmos DB certainly being awesome as a database, right? And one of those things is the global replication. However, prior to this feature, that rep the way that model worked is you had a single writable master database in whatever region you had set it up in, and then every region you added in Cosmos DB was a read replica. So this works great for applications where you have applications deployed in different regions with a Cosmos DB database backing them up in each region because you're going to get that super single digit latency within there. With multi-master, now every region is now a full writable master, right? So what does that mean? That means now you get single digit latency on your reads and your writes within there. And of course, you get the five nines availability for all those operations as well. Now with multi-master, because it's now masterless, uh, we need a way to provide conflict resolution. So we've provided multiple ways of doing conflict resolution uh, within your applications. And really what this means in terms of a value prop is you really get unlimited scalability for all your endpoints, for reads and writes. Uh, and this is really super important. Um, right now, you can do this in all Azure region. Uh, is anybody a government customer? Or do you do government work? I would expect more out of this group. As I say, we, government contractors. Government contractors. Okay, so available in all regions, including all the U.S. Gov clouds and all sovereign clouds everywhere around the world. So Cosmos DB is a ring zero service within Azure. So as soon as we light up a new region within Azure, Cosmos DB is automatically there. In fact, there's a lot of services within Azure that are now starting to use Cosmos DB because of all the great features and benefits we've gotten. That this is certainly one of them. So all Azure regions, uh, all data models, uh, this is brand new for things like MongoDB. Cassandra already had this kind of uh, capability. But for MongoDB, this is now available for uh, Table API, for Graph. Uh, all the models are available in there. It's also supported with all the SDKs as well, so you don't need to do uh, anything different with your SDKs or just use the latest ones. So how do you set up? or how do you enable uh, multi-master. So all you do is just go in and create a new Cosmos DB account, uh, enter in your subscription, the resource group, account name, select your API, select a location, although now location doesn't really matter much anymore because you can add, you're going to add more regions to your databases anyway, so this doesn't make sense anymore really, right? Or it's just a, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, and then select multi-master right here. So just click the little button right here, for you guys off to the side, I'm pointing at the multi-master button. Um, and then click next. So we'll then go and provision uh, your new multi-master account. After you're done with that, you then need to just go and add regions. Where do you want your databases to be uh, available? And you'll notice here, and this is a change in uh, the user interface in our portal, uh, now when you add a new region in there, you have reads and writes enabled for all of them. The other thing I want to point out too is one of the things that's different is uh, you don't configure any failover with this. So because every database is now writable, if failover is basically implicit, right? So if a region becomes unavailable or goes down, and that never happens, uh, your application can automatically just write to a, another replica now. So basically you have an RTO of zero uh, when you're building applications and using multi-master. Uh, within Cosmos DB. In your applications, uh, it's really very easy to use. The only thing you need to change, other than just downloading the latest SDK, uh, is just set use multiple write locations to true. Uh, the other thing you can do as well is uh, there's another property within the connection policy. I should have shown the example here. Uh, but what you can do is when you deploy your application, you can feed it what the current region is it's running in, and then what we'll do, we have a, a, a collection of preferred locations uh, built into the connection uh, client for Cosmos DB. So if you set what region it's running in, so say it's running in East US or in Virginia or in West US, uh, we will auto-populate a list of preferred regions within there that has essentially kind of a, a, an ordered list of the next available region. So if a region became unavailable, uh, and you send a request and then it basically did fail because the region was down or it was unavailable, we'll automatically ret retry that request 
uh, in the next available region. So this is what I mean when I say there's really zero need for failover within here. Basically, everything is a failover all the time, right, or can be. Um, I had a customer come and talk to me yesterday, and they were asking, how do I test this? And I went back to the dev team, and um, they said, well, you, know, you can't really test it. I mean, you can't, we don't have a way to simulate bringing down an entire region, which kind of makes sense. Uh, so I thought about this for a while, and uh, I came up with an actual solution for this. So if you wanted to test failover for multi-master, the way you would do this is to go into the portal and then just remove a region within your application. And then just run a client that's just, I don't know, doing reads and writes against the database, maybe like every second it's doing a query against your region. And then just wait to see what happens. Because eventually what's going to happen is uh, it'll then connect to the second region. And the only thing you'll notice is a little bit of latency uh, because it's now going to travel to the next region over. So anyway, this is really, you know, an amazing feature for us and really helps even strengthen uh, the five nines availability uh, for you and your applications. So being multi-master, we need to provide some means for doing conflict resolution. Uh, and we've got two uh, available means within there, uh, last writer wins, and then also a custom user-defined procedure. Uh, and let me go a little bit into each one of those. I'm very thirsty today. I don't know why, because it's so humid here. Maybe it'll be better when that hurricane gets up here. Huh? <laughs> I'm hoping my flight doesn't get canceled actually later today. So, <clears throat> what's that? Um, yeah, flying, flying back to Redmond, like around five o'clock or so. So the eye wall should be coming right over DC, right around then. <laughs> so first, let's talk about uh, last rider win. So this is the default. Uh, means for doing conflict resolution uh, in Cosmos DB. And here you can see in the portal uh, when I'm creating a new collection in the settings uh, thing here, I'm just going to select last writer wins. Uh, and then what I need to do is I need to specify a property within my document that I'm going to use to resolve it. So here you can see, and I've got a little box here, uh, conflict resolver property. And then what I've done is I've specified a property, I'm just calling it user defined ID. And the way this works is if I have two or more writable regions and I simultaneously write the same record or two records at the same time with the same ID in there and cause a conflict, I'm going to use that property right here, user defined ID, to decide which one's going to win. So in this case, I've got a record, new contact, Scott Guthrie, and then I've also got Satya with the same user ID, with the same ID for the document coming in. And I've got to decide, okay, now which one's going to win. In this case, Satya is going to beat out Scott because his user-defined ID is four and Scott's is three. Um, the other, but yeah, good question. Sorry, so are we responsible for coding in the auto increment for the user ID? So you can use any ID you want. If you don't specify an ID, we'll generate one for you. But if you generate your own ID, then this is a potential. So this is kind of contrived. As an example, at least on an insert, because generally most people are going to use a GUID or some other thing that's going to be unique. Uh, so, I mean, one thing I want to point out is even with a multi master or masterless scenario, conflicts generally should be pretty rare, right? But they can happen, uh, particularly on like an update, is where you might see a conflict where you've already got an existing record in there and then you have two regions simultaneously do an update to that record. Uh, maybe it's an inventory database, so two people order something on two different sides of the world and then you need to update the inventory database. Which one gets there first, or how are you gonna decide who wins? You can use something like this, right? And then define the property. So which, I don't know, which customer or which anything uh, within there, or what you can do is not specify anything in there, and then what we'll do is we'll use the timestamp in there, which makes it truly kind of last writer wins, right? Because the higher the timestamp value, the later the record was written or updated. No, I wouldn't, right? So I'm, I'm, this is totally contrived and made up just for the purposes of illustration, really, right? right? So, so if we define the ID, the property, then we're responsible for the logic to incremental or whatever. But if we don't, then you just use a timestamp with this time. Difference. Right, and to be clear, this user-defined ID, this is, just a, this is just a property. This isn't the ID on the document itself. Right, so 
Is it just a numeric comparator? Yes. If you want it to be true, just last writer wins, then don't put anything in here. We'll auto populate this with the underscore TS for your document. And that's true, last writer wins. So, and one more question. What's the, the, the period of time in which two whites are considered simultaneous? Are they within a microsecond of each other, within two minutes of each other? Yeah, so there's uh, the question is when is a right considered committed? Yeah. Right, so it's after a quorum of replicas uh, have replicated uh, that data within their collection. So it's not like um, my GPA is coming to our right argument. There will be some delay, right? Correct, and it's local to the region. So here's what doesn't happen is it doesn't have to replicate to everything all over the world for it to be a commit. That would take too long, it would blow up our SLAs. It's generally that's correct. So it's I think you're generally if you do have a conflict, it's going to be on an update rather than on an insert, right? It's rare to get them on inserts, particularly if you're using a unique identifier uh, within there. So yeah, another question. That's an awesome question. The answer is, for last writer wins, we don't log any of these. So there's no conflict, there's no feed, or the conflict feed itself does not get any records in here. However, if that's something you want, then let me go on to the next steps here and I'll show you what we handle in those situations. So the next uh, conflict resolution mode is a custom. And this one, you implement a user-defined procedure, which is basically a stored procedure, uh, but it has a special signature. So within the portal here, just select the merge procedure custom, and then you enter in the name of the stored procedure that you're going to use to then resolve the conflicts uh, within here. Now, this stored procedure is registered to the collection, so the only data this stored procedure can use is the data within the same collection. Now, here's an example of what a stored procedure might look like. And you can see this has a very kind of special uh, function signature within here. And you have to implement this fun function signature uh, for this thing to get called uh, and work. And essentially, you can write whatever logic you want in here. I'm basically, in this example here, using the same user-defined ID to resolve uh, the conflict. Uh, but this provides you additional functionality or uh, flexibility uh, for deciding how it is you want to resolve that conflict, uh, whether it's an insert or an update. Within here. The other thing I want to point out too is uh, with with uh, last right wins. So this is only used for inserts and updates. For deletes, if someone deletes a record and then some other region updates it, we don't do anything, right? So we're not we don't bring deletes back from the dead. Basically, is what it is. So that you wouldn't we wouldn't handle that uh, in that situation. So this is what happens for inserts and updates within here. And then one other thing I want to talk about is then there's actually kind of a, a third mode, if you will. Uh, and this gets to his question here, which is we have a custom mode where if you don't put anything in the stored procedure here, we won't do any conflict resolution for you at all. Uh, and what that means is we will then write all the conflicts out to a conflict feed, uh, and then you can process those yourself. So uh, essentially what that means is you would write another application or a little service and then regularly pull the conflicts feed, and then read them in, and then decide how you want to handle them. Now, this is more work, obviously, but it gives you a lot more flexibility, because what you can do is, if it's its own app, you can essentially talk to anything in the world and figure out, how do I want to resolve my conflict? You could go query another service, another database, another app, anything you want, and you can build all your logic uh, within that app to decide how you want to resolve the conflicts. So, does that answer your question over there? Yeah. So this is what you want to do. If you want to be able to look at conflicts uh, or be able to log them, you can do them this way. You could use the same logic that you had for last writer wins uh, or any other method that you want to use to resolve it, uh, but just do it within uh, your own application. Right. So one thing I'll point out is too is uh, we have a feature called change feed, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later. That kind of provides automatic notification when something happens like an operation like insert and update within Cosmos DB, and it's used to build kind of Lambda architectures if you want to do, uh, you know, like a, a 
hot path, cold path, or do some kind of spark analysis, or do any kind of event based programming. Uh, Conflict feed doesn't have that eventing capability within it, so whatever you write has to will have to go and like run on a poll uh, to go and look at this thing. So, uh, yeah, one more question. Conflict feed. So that would mean that when we use conflict feed, no any change in database happens when I write on the conflict feed. Yeah. So this means that we have two conflict feed updates. We will just go to the feed and no updates happen on the database. So something's going to get committed, but the other thing's going to be the conflict, right? So let me show you here. So I have a little picture of this thing. So here is what a conflict might look like in an update, right? So I've got the current document. This is the guy that's committed. And then here's my, here's my conflict sitting right here, right? So and actually, when we write out to the conflict feed, you can actually go into the portal and look at them in here. Now. Currently, you can't really do anything uh, with this in here. I actually asked the dev team if, hey, it'd be nice if customers can actually go in here and just select whether or not to update the original with the conflict in there or just get rid of it. Uh, so I think they're gonna they're gonna provide that capability in a in a future build uh, for the portal on this thing. But for right now, this is just a place where you can kind of look at them uh, within the portal if you want. What specific record will be used? Yeah, so it's because it's matchless, it's kind of non deterministic, if you will, right? So I can't really tell you <laughs> which one's the one that's going to be the actual committed record in there versus which one's going to be the conflict. Um, it just kind of is what it is. It's, I guess, whoever gets the, the, the core and faster, I guess, a little bit in there. Uh, so, I mean, just keep in mind, I mean, it's, this is rare, right? I mean, we're going to replicate your data in milliseconds globally uh, around the world. So, getting conflicts should generally be a pretty rare occurrence. Um, you know, but they do happen. So, that's why we're providing. Uh, multiple ways uh, of being able to resolve those things from simple using a last writer wins type policy to completely custom, build your own, however you want to handle it, the most complex business logic on the planet possible, you can do it that way too. So, a question in the back. Is there any way you can be a visual record more than one successful that way? The original record. So, the original. Uh, so, these two had to prior to the first successful update. Uh, no, we don't have that capability. So you're going to have one's going to get committed, and the other one's going to generate a conflict. All right now, you can have multiple conflicts. So if I had multiple regions, let's just say I had three regions, four regions, and three of them did an update on the same record, I can have an original one that committed, but then I can have multiple conflicts from that. So what I would see is the same record here each time, and then multiple conflicts listed in here. But we don't have it, yeah, I mean the only way you could have anything like that is if you baked in uh, using our change feed, and then kind of build a kind of lambda architecture where you're kind of feeding that into something else. But that's you, you then go and then you could go and look at a, a prior instance of that article. We get that too, like document versioning is another question we've got. There's no, we don't provide any document versioning, but you could actually build your own using something like a change feed. Right, so any operation, any insert or update on that thing triggers a change feed event. Go write that off into another log, right, and then put a version stamp on it, and then you could go go back and look at all the old versions of that document. So you could you could implement something like that, uh, but we don't provide something like that out of the box. So the only way you get this kind of conflict is if you're getting rid of all last white wins. Is it the time stamp for same? Otherwise, it would never. Be yeah, so I get that question too. Uh, if the timestamps are the same, one document, yeah, well, one document is going to win. It's just 
Yeah, and again, that's kind of non-deterministic. So, so this this would never occur here. Then. Yeah, you would never. Well, with last rider wins, yeah. we don't log any conflicts. We just handle them, and they're, it's done. Exactly. Yeah. The only way you're going to get a log conflict is if you turn off. If you basically. If you use this method here. It's not likely, but yeah. That's correct. We're just going to pick a winner. It's non-deterministic, as Dad's like to say. So, are these different options for conflict resolution configurable per table, or is it for your entire conflict? By collection. Yep. And I was holding a question for later, but this is kind of relevant. I'm interested in the strong consistency model. What does that actually mean? Let's say you have five regions enabled. Does strong mean that I get it through the width across all five regions? That's correct. Correct. Okay. Right. Which is why it has a huge impact on latency, availability, and throughput. Because you have to get a quorum now across all those different regions. So I write a record in West US, and that region's not going to be available until it gets all the way to, say, Singapore or North Europe or wherever it is. And those, all those things have to happen. So this is why you should play with it. I don't, it's, let me put it this way there's very few customers of ours that use strong consistency within this. They tend to use session, right? Because they want to be able to read their own rights from the application. Uh, endpoint that's connecting to that instance of Cosmos DB. A lot of them, you know, in some cases, eventual is really good. Uh, bounded staleness is probably second in terms of that. So I'd say about 70% using session, and then about 20, a little more than 20% using bounded staleness. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm a little confused about the unit of work in the table. So, so if I have a unit of work that includes three updates and the same unit of work that takes place in two different locations, and the first Two are done at one timestamp, and the third one is done where the other transaction has a faster timestamp. Am I going to end up with like half the tables updated by one transaction and the other half updated by a different transaction, even though they're two different transactions with two different people? You see what I'm saying? Struggling. So you've got a single. So two different record. Two, two, the debit by this guy, debit credit, debit credit. This debit takes first over here. And the credit and the other one the credit takes first it ends up that you end up with a debit from this guy's account and the credit from this guy's account because this guy was a little faster on the debit and this guy was a little faster on the credit. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're updating the same account with like last update kind of thing and, and it just so happens that this guy did his first transaction faster than the other guy and this guy's second, tra you know, his second transaction was eight microseconds faster than the other guy's. So you're going to end up with like so what I would say is the design doesn't sound right to me. You should do that in a single operation. Right. So then, then the time cap should be at the unit of work or the commit. If you're writing to a single record or a single item within Cosmos DB, you should do that with uh, basically with an atomic piece of code, right? One single request. Right. So do it. But you got a debit and a credit. All replace. Those are two different, two different, two different table entries, two different records you get. Debit entry and credit entry to a different account. Right, so we don't credit support. Cash, is your question do we support transactions? Yeah, kind of. Do you support no, transactions? No, we don't support transactions. Oh. So we do within the single, um, we do within a single uh, uh, operation or collection right there, but we don't. We don't have a we don't have a thing where you can go begin transaction, do a bunch of work, and then commit transaction. Okay, that's not supported. Okay. No, it's, no it's, it's, it kind of again. This kind of blows up once we start. Put, we, we, let's put it this way: we don't put locks on anything in Cosmos DB, and that's how we guarantee kind of the single digit latency and the high availability. Yeah, we don't block anything that goes on within there. So this is something you would have to build in sure. your application, right? It's when you've got everything together, jam it into Cosmos DB, uh, and we'll do that in less than ten milliseconds. Yep. No, I'm going to kill it down because we're just taking it off the questions. <laughs> we do it actually. We so we have an emulator available uh, supports all the data models 
that we support in Cosmos DB. Uh, you can get that uh, and download it. I'll send you, or I'll just show you where you can get that in there. Uh, we strongly encourage customers to do their prototyping and testing uh, using the emulator first because it doesn't cost anything to do it. Uh, you can also get uh, query statistics, so are you usage uh, for the queries that you're running in there as well. So uh, it's pretty well instrumented. Uh, and every, I definitely recommend people use that. One last question. Sure. Speaking of cost, I noticed that in your multi master part, there's a checkbox to enable multi master. Is that because of the cost difference? There is a cost difference for multi master. Uh, so now, basically, uh, you're going to write to multiple locations everywhere, whereas versus before you were writing to a single location. Writes are going to cost you more than reads, so yes, multi-master costs more to run than it would if you were using the single master or not enabling it. Okay, all right. I'll talk about costs and other stuff a little bit later. We're doing some good stuff um, around the cost uh, end of things. Uh, so, so custom asynchronous. So, kind of here's what it would look like if you were going to process uh, this right here, and you can kind of write a case statement, so I want to handle my inserts differently than my replaces. Uh, for the deletes, obviously here, um, you know, if you want to bring a record back from the dead, I guess you could, I don't recommend it. Uh, and then, uh, as you process those, you can then go and then just delete the conflicts uh, after it's processed, uh, and then just move on to the next one uh, within there. So, let's do a demo. Okay, so actually, let me back up. So what I've got is I have two Cosmos DB accounts created here. I've got a single master account, and let me give you a look on that. So this account has a single write region in Southeast Asia, uh, and then I have two read regions. I've got one in West US 2 and one in North Europe. So my scenario here is I'm a company, I'm based out of Singapore, I provision my account here, and we've added uh, customers in different parts of the globe, so we're replicating out now to the West US uh, and to North Europe. Um, I now also have uh, a multi-master account. So within here, I'll click on this, and you can see the difference. Uh, I've got the same regions here, Southeast Asia, West US 2, and North Europe. Uh, the difference here, of course, is uh, I'm read or write enabled on both those regions. So let me go back. And what I want to show you is I've got an application here. So this application is just a VM, and it's set up in West US 2. And I'm going to contact and talk to my Cosmos DB database that's located there in West US 2. So I just want to run some latency tests just to give you an idea of what's going to happen. So here, I've got a single master, and I'm going to do some read and write latency testing. I've got three regions set up. Uh, in this order. So I've got, I'm using the preferred locations collection within my connection policy, and I'm going to prefer to start with West US 2 for doing all my reads, and then I'm going to go to Southeast Asia, and then to North Europe. So if any of those become unavailable, that would be the order of failover uh, within my application. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to test 100 reads against region West US 2, and let's just see how that goes. And as you would expect, this is super fast because my application is located in the same region and we're doing mostly single millisecond reads uh, from that location. So now what I want to do is I want to test a write. So I'm going to test 100 writes in this application and as you would expect, these are going to be quite a bit slower. And the reason is my application in West US 2 now needs to traverse Azure's backbone and then go all the way to Southeast Asia and then do the writes. And it's going to do 100 of those, and that's going to take a little bit of time. Yep, and there it's done. So there you can see around 170, 180 milliseconds for each of that. So now, with Multimaster, I'm going to do the same test. So I'm going to create a uh, document client, uh, and I'm going to call the same, it's configured the same exact way, West US 2, Southeast Asia, and North Europe. And let's test 100 reads, and as you'd expect, that's going to be fast as it was before. Now, let's test 100 writes. And whoa, that's super fast. Did you catch it? So now I just did 100 reads or 100 writes against West US 2. And that, of course, is now blazingly fast. Right? 
How is that possible? Yes. I've now replicated my database to be write enabled in every region uh, that I've configured it. No, we replicate on the back end. So you write to your local database, we replicate that in the background. Any other questions about that awesome demo? <laughs> it is awesome, isn't it? Wait, question? They, you basically talk to a single global endpoint within Cosmos DB. The only difference is you set your current location. So how I configured this in the demo is I set a preferred, we have a preferred locations collection within the connection policy, and I can set which order I want uh, within there. We actually have a new feature now available in our SDK, so all I have to do when I create a new connection client is just set the current location within there and then deploy that with my app. So if I have an app in West US 2, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, you can, and you can ship this in the config file, right? So send the same bits, deploy each of the same bits to each of your locations, and then just the config difference is gonna be what location is it's running in. And what you do is if you set current location inside the connection policy, we will then auto-populate the, all the preferred locations that you're running in. And then the nice thing about this is that we've already figured out the latencies between all the different regions. So if I'm in West US 2 and East US and Southeast Asia, and I'm deployed in West US, and I set my current location to West US, we will automatically pre-populate it to run in West US, and then go to East US, and then go to Southeast Asia. See what I'm saying? So that's the only thing you need to do is just set current location for whatever region it's running in. We'll auto-populate what your failover regions are. And so if a region becomes unavailable, we'll just automatically retry that same request into a separate region. And the only thing you're going to notice is difference in latency. But you're not going to lose any data. Cool? All right, let's do some conflict resolution. Now, um, what I did is I built a little app, and I can show you where this is available. Our devs wrote a conflict generator. Um, and I want to point out, this is actually really tricky to do. Uh, and it doesn't always work because generating conflicts, as you might suspect, uh, can be tough. So what I've got here is I've got an application, and what it does is it connects three different uh, Cosmos DB clients to three different locations, and then I stick those all into a collection, and then I execute them all on separate threads, all simultaneously. And each of them is going to, in this case, do three inserts in three different regions at the same time with the same ID, and try to get one or more of them to commit so that I can generate a conflict on the back end. So let's try this. So I'm going to insert a document with the same ID in multiple regions. Let's see what happens. So here I've got three documents. So it's got the ID of 955, Scott Guthrie, and Redmond. And I've got three different user-defined IDs. So I've got a defined ID of 4, 2, and 0. So in this scenario here, I'm going to use last writer wins. Uh, to resolve the conflict. So let me go back and show you in my database what this is going to look like. So let me go to my multi-master database. So here I had, this is what I did the latency demo out of here, this contacts database. So here I have last writer wins. And within here, you can see I've, collect, I've selected last writer wins as my conflict resolution mode and then user defined ID as my conflict resolver policy. So I just did three inserts with ID 995 with three different user defined IDs. Let's go in here and see which one won. So here, so this is user defined ID zero. So what this tells me is I actually did not generate a conflict because this one replicated faster than the other writes happening. So let's try it again. So here I'm going to generate another. This is ID 761, and then I've got user-defined ID of 0, 4, and 7. Now let's go ahead and take a look. And I want to refresh this. Okay, that one actually generated a conflict because user-defined ID, which was committed in North Europe, actually won the conflict. So generally speaking, 
West US 2 should win, but I'm executing all three of these at the same time. And here what we see is I actually had a conflict, and this one is the one that won, the one that I committed in North Europe. Cool? Easy, right? I know. No more conflicts ever. Okay. Let's try a little different demo. So what I'm going to do, let me say no here. So now I'm going to do an update. So this is going to be against a collection. What am I doing on time, by the way? I'm at an hour right now, so 50 more minutes. Can you stop at 10.50? Okay, let me go super fast. So here I've got one other collection, and this one is set up for manual. So I've selected Merge Procedure Custom, but I didn't supply any store procedure. So what's going to happen is any conflicts are going to end up in this conflict feed right here. So let's see if we can generate a conflict. So I'm going to create a new document with ID 730, and then I'm going to do three updates in three different regions. And let's just see if that generated a conflict. Nope. All right, let's try it again. All right, insert a new record, ID of 60, and then we'll do three updates on that. And here we go, I've got some conflicts. So here we go. So I've got my ID of 60, here's the current document, this is the one that was committed, and then here's my conflict update. So this went into West US 2, and then this one went into North Europe. And here you can see, here's my current document, this is the one that was committed in Southeast Asia, and then I generated two conflicts out of this thing, one in West US 2, and another one in North Europe. Cool. You can clap. Yay! They generated conflicts. <laughs> it's really super hard. So, okay. All right, back to slides. How do you resolve it? Sorry. How do you resolve it? Yeah. So, you could, what you would do is just either write an application. Right to read and pull against the conflict feed. Right, that was the thing you just saw on the screen right there. It's basically just a, a rendering of what's in the conflict feed, and then you decide how you want to handle it. You right? can't do it from the GUI though. You have to... Right now, you can't do it from the from the portal, but this is something I've asked our dev team to, to look at in case customers want to be able to just pick right. a which one pick which one should be the winner right. uh, within there. Uh, but right now, uh, you would do this in uh, your app in an application. Okay, so let me quickly go through some uh, recent updates. So uh, at Ignite two weeks ago, we announced the GA of our uh, Cassandra API. Uh, so now Cosmos DB can provide a fully managed database as a service uh, for Cassandra. Uh, no need to manage clusters or nodes. All the other heartache involved with managing Cassandra is all gone. You can use Cosmos DB to do this. Still same single digit latency, five nines availability. Uh, support for Apache Cassandra 3.11 uh, and CQL binary protocol version 4. Uh, we have a new JavaScript SDK. So this was completely rewritten uh, from the ground up using TypeScript. Uh, has support for promises. We have we introduced a new object model in here. If you're familiar or have used Cosmos DB, you have to use this thing called a URI factory to get references to objects within Cosmos DB. So we have a database URI, a collection URI, a document URI. Uh, this does away with that entirely. So uh, when you're going through and, and programming your applications, it's databases dot database ID dot collections dot collection ID so so on. So much cleaner. Uh, we're going to replicate this kind of object model uh, across all of our SDKs, uh, including our .NET SDK. Uh, and in fact, we just announced last week that uh, once we're done updating that, we're going to open source uh, our .NET SDK as well. Uh, which is cool. You can now go and see how we've implemented uh, that SDK, and look to, we're going to look to do that for all of our SDKs within there. This, of course, supports uh, supports multi-master, like all of our SDKs do now. Uh, on the pricing front, I want to let you know that we now have uh, the ability to do reserved capacity uh, with Cosmos DB. This works just like reserved instances or reserved capacity for VMs. Uh, 
you make a commitment for two, three years uh, for RUs. Uh, the longer you go and the higher the RUs you reserve, the deeper the discounts, all the way up to 65% off uh, list price within there. So after you've done your dev and your test and you're like, okay, we're bought in on Cosmos DB, definitely this is something you should explore uh, to get the deepest discounts possible uh, for your Cosmos DB usage. Um, yep. Also on the price point, we now have a lower entry point for databases. Uh, prior to this, uh, you had to provision 50,000 RUs per database. Uh, you can now do this starting at 10,000 RUs. Uh, the other thing I want to point out too is uh, you can also share RUs across collections. So let's just say you provision 10,000 RUs for a database. You can say, uh, collection one, I want you to have 2,000 RUs out of that 10K, and then the rest of you collections can share the other eight. Uh, so this is nice if you have collections that are particularly going to need more throughput. Uh, you can just carve those off and then let the other collections just share amongst themselves. Uh, so a little more way to get more efficient, more prescriptive about how you're using uh, your resource usage uh, within Cosmos DB. Uh, we also have lots of free options. So you can go and sign up for a trial account. Uh, you can also go and sign up for a free Cosmos DB account. So this is different. Uh, you can go to akams slash try Cosmos DB and just provision a Cosmos DB account. Uh, we'll keep that up and running for you for 30 days. You get your own key, uh, your own URL, your own key. You can try it for 30 days. Uh, we also allow you to extend this, so you can go in and extend that if you want uh, and run that longer than 30 days. Also, the Cosmos DB emulator, uh, I want to point that out. That's very handy for doing local testing. Uh, you can also run this in a Docker container, uh, Windows, Docker for Windows container as well. Uh, and then uh, deploy that, so you can also uh, run that as well. We have uh, scripts online uh, in GitHub for how to set that up. Uh, I want to point out all of this where to learn more. Uh, I've got a minute. I can't. They're freaking out. Oh, I'm going to post all my stuff online. So let me go even faster through these things, uh, so you get no chance to write them down. Um, where I would start is with our docs uh, right here. Uh, we have a really killer section on concepts that's really super important to learn. Uh, let me just show you kind of quickly. If you go to our documentation here and then go to concepts, uh, I would strongly recommend you go through and read each of these in here. We talk about how we do replication uh, and multi-master in here, uh, how we manage throughput, how to get and set throughput, Partitioning, indexing, consistency models, change fee, TTLs. Uh, there is a ton of really deep information to conceptually understand how we built uh, Cosmos DB. Uh, all the multi model API support is in here, so you can get examples on how to get started with all this stuff. Uh, we, show, we show the support levels for each of the different uh, models that we support in here, including Cassandra, Gremlin, and Mongo. Uh, and then, again, I just want to point out, we've got all of these SDKs out on GitHub. Uh, all of these have samples uh, within them. Uh, in particular, I want to point out with our .NET SDK, we have an interesting folder here called Patterns. Uh, so if you're interested in learning how to handle things like time series or do event sourcing, uh, lots, of, lots and lots of very interesting samples in here. We also have examples that show you how to build uh, kind of test harnesses for your application, so how to measure RU usage, how to measure latency. Uh, the sample you saw there where I was doing multi-master and then uh, counting off the latency between there, it's just, a, it's just a very simple application with a stopwatch on there, but we have examples fully built out, also calculate RUs for you, uh, and uh, also at what percentile uh, as well within there. So um, I think that's it, and I can't believe uh, it did fly by. Yeah. So, anyway, that's it. Thank you very much. All right, folks, you got it.